Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Good to have you here with us today. Um, I was going to talk about something that uh, we've not talked about over the 23 years since we started this church on a Mother's Day, and uh, it's it, it relates. It relates. Uh, not everybody, one out of eight couples, actually want to be a mother or a parent, and cannot, and they struggle with infertility, and they come every every Mother's Day. They come. They sit there. Sometimes those are dreams that are deferred. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that because we are in this series. uh, We're looking at families are messy and there's all kinds of mess. That's one of them that, you know, one out of eight couples, they don't really, that's not a mess they invited into their life. They didn't want that necessarily. So why does it, why is it so high, you know, in our church, really nationwide? Why is the, why is it uh, so pervasive? Well, there's some different reasons for that. Uh, the fertility problems really breaks down into thirds. One third is generally a problem with the female. One is with the, with the guy, the male. And then another third is with both of them. And by the way, fertility experts say that infertility, they define that by a couple trying to have kids for a year and, uh, and, 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 it, and not having conception, or if they're 35, the woman is 35 or older, and she tries for six months or more, then they, that they consider that a, 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 a uh, infertility problem. So part of the problem is that the current structure uh, of our American society, uh, people are expected to go to school, go to college, And they put off getting married. They put off often having kids. And then often in our society, college entails graduate school more and more now. And so they go to graduate school. The the woman, she graduates. And now there's this pressure to go and start her career, partially because of the student loans that they've incurred to get that. And so there's just this, uh, this longer delay of before even people, before they even start to look to have, uh, to try to have kids and to conceive. So that's, that's one part at, at one level, uh, people putting off uh, marriage uh, and, and, and trying to have kids. The human biology is that fertility rates drastically fall after age 30. So after 30, uh, it, there's a huge drop. And then on top of that, the average age of menopause has been going down. So for our grandmother's uh, generation, they, the average age of menopause was 54 years old. Now for baby boomers and now as uh, uh, Gen Xers are entering into that, 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 that age, it's dropped to 51. So that's three years, which may not sound like a lot, but if you go, that, uh, go uh, spread that across an entire population, that's massive. Now why is that? Why is it dropping? Well, <clears throat> there's some different reasons that, that the scientists think that that might, might go into that. One of them, they think, is environmental. Is, environmental is at a big impact. In other words, they just don't know uh, the, uh, the effects of people drinking out of styrofoam cups every day, e- uh, drinking milk or chicken or uh, sh- eating shrimp uh, that's packed with hormones and other kinds of things. They're just, they don't know what, you know, that has, uh, what kind of impact they have, but they figure it has some of it. So you have this rising age of people delaying having, having, uh, even attempting. And then you have, uh, then you have the lowering of 
of, uh, of, of on the top end of menopause, and, inf and really uh, conception is really off the table 10 years before menopause. So you have this lower, smaller gap, gap, and then you have more and more sexually transmitted diseases. 10% of infertility problems are from STDs. So you just don't have, there's this, this smaller, smaller gap that's taking place. And so that's a big part of the problem. So you have a lot of couples that struggle uh, with infertility. And if you have any ounce of sensitivity at all, when you meet them, like for example, at church, uh, you can see that there's some times when it's difficult and it can be difficult, emotionally challenging for them. It can touch every part of their life. But when they, when they come to a Christmas pageant, it reminds them of a dream that's deferred for them. When, uh, when they see a, a woman who's pregnant, that can be a reminder. Of course, Mother's Day, Father's Day, all of those are just a reminder of that. So we're looking, as I said, at uh, this, we're in this series, Families Are Messy, and we've been looking at the patriarchs, uh, patriarchs, the matriarchs in Genesis, their families, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, uh, and, their, and their wives, uh, Sarah, and, and uh, Rebecca, Rachel, and, 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 and they've had, they had messy families. So we're kind of pulling from that saying, you know, we have a lot of the same challenges. Now, certainly not everybody here has uh, a, a problem with infertility, but you may struggle with a dream that you have that's, that hasn't been realized. You know, a dream, uh, something that you're, you're wanting to, to be different in your life, a dream you're thinking of, hey, I would love to have a life partner and I don't have that person. I would love to, I've been praying for my child to uh, come to Christ, and it's now been years, and they seem farther than ever away from the Lord. Or I've been praying for my health, to something to change. So many of us, probably all of us, have dreams that we kind of treasure, and, we're, and, and, and they're deferred. We're wondering, when is it going to take place? When is it going to happen for me? And so we can really apply uh, the lessons that we learned from Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah, their dream was to have a child, and they had infertility problems. They, they had a dream early on. They got married, and, and, and for decades, they were wondering, when is it going to happen for us? And uh, they were people of faith, so they would go to God in prayer. They would walk away from, those, uh, from some of those moments in prayer, and they would be like, assured, hey, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen for us. Something significant is going to take place. We're going to have a child. We're going to have a son. And yet decade after decade would go by. And that was unrealized. Very, very frustrating for them. Just kind of, it, it, they got into their 50s, 60s, into their 70s. Abraham into his 80s. Still no, no child. It's a dream deferred for them. Martin Luther King Jr. once preached a message about deferred dreams, and he used this text, I put it on your outline there, Romans 15, 24. It was originally written by the Apostle Paul, likely from the, when he was in the city of Corinth, there, which is in Greece. He said this, I plan to do so when I go to Spain, he says, I'm, I'm headed your way. I'm going to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. So he's looking for, it's going to be a, a pleasurable experience for him. He's saying, hey, I'm, I'm open to go down to the Mediterranean all the way to the end, work, work my way up into Spain. Hopefully I'll be able to hit Rome, spend some time with you guys. It's going to be great. The problem is, he doesn't go like that. He goes to Spain, but it's not like he had wanted. <clears throat> Dr. King, back in 1959, here's what he says about that passage. He says, quote, But notice what happened to this noble dream and this glowing hope that gripped Paul's life. He never got to Rome in the sense that he had hoped. He went there only as a prisoner and not as a free man. He spent his days in that city, that ancient city, in a little prison cell, held captive of his daring faith in Jesus Christ. Neither was Paul able to walk the dusty roads of Spain, nor its curvaceous slopes, nor watch its busy coast life because he died a martyr's death in Rome. The story of Paul's life was the tragic story 
of a shattered dream and a blasted hope. Life is full of this experience. There is hardly anyone here this morning who is not set out for some distant Spain, some momentous goal, some glorious realization, only to find out that we had to settle for so much less. We've never been able to walk as free men through the streets of our realm. Instead, we were forced to live our lives in a little confining cell which circumstance had built around us. Life seems to have a fatal flaw, and history seems to have an irrational and unpredictable streak. Ultimately, we will all die not having received what was promised. Our dreams are constantly tossed and blown by staggering winds of disappointment. Every praying person understands this. We've prayed, we've asked God for stuff. We've said, God, I need this breakthrough. I need this healing. I need, I, I need you to move for my child or for my parents. I need, I need a breakthrough. My marriage needs a breakthrough. And, all this, and you just look at it and it, it doesn't happen. Certainly doesn't happen maybe like you had expected or, or, or wanted. And what do you do? So we're going to look at Abraham and Sarah. They, also, they have two names, uh, Sarai and Abram, same people. And we're going to pull from them, from their story. First thing, three things that I don't think are all that helpful, then a couple of things that are. Number one, unhelpful responses when you have a d deferred dream, and that's worrying. Of course, this for many of us is our go-to, right? We, we don't have, life has got problems, we have challenges, we have our dreams that aren't met, and we, our go-to places will worry, because that, you know, that helps. At least we feel like it helps us. It's like this weird therapy session, you know. If I worry enough, maybe things will change. Jesus, of course, warns against that. He says, hey, do you think that by worrying you can add one hour to your life? It's a rhetorical question, you know. And so we need to, ask, I think he asked it like that because we have to ask ourselves that. Why am I worrying again? Why am I doing this? Is this going to add anything? No, it doesn't. And so this is uh, easy to fall into. Sarah's got an unfilled desire to be a mother. And now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Another place it says, Abram and, and, and Sarah were already old and very well advanced in years. And Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So they had a fair amount to worry about. You see, in uh, the ancient Near Eastern culture, it was an absolute tragedy to not have a child. I mean, it's terrible. It's hard couples that want kids and can't. It's very, very traumatic. But in that day, that's where they pulled, for, especially for a woman. It's not like she had another way to get her self-esteem. It's not like she said, well, I can't have kids, but at least I have this career and I'm an attorney or I own my own business or I'm a teacher. No, if, if, a, if a woman in that culture didn't, wasn't able to have a child, she, her life was a failure. I mean, it was devastating. And for a guy, for a man, uh, his name would not be carried on. And it was also part of the way that they had set up in their structure to have retirement. I mean, their retirement, they didn't have 401ks. I mean, their, their retirement were their kids. Kids would get old, they would help take care of them. It was their security. So not having security would be something to worry about. And it was the place where they passed on their, their stories, their lineage. They didn't have TV at, at night. They would sit around a, the fire that they would make and grandpa and and grandma and the, and the parents, they would pass on the stories to their kids. And then those stories would get passed on. That's how they knew about where they had come from. And you don't have kids, you aren't able to do that. So there was a fair amount for them to worry about. <clears throat> and that's what they were falling into. They were falling into uh, to, to, to that. And also when they find out that they're, that they're not pregnant, you know, there's all insecurities that happen, all kinds of things that they could worry about. Number two is blaming. When we have deferred dreams, we can blame. And with infertility, that can happen as well, of course. And this, you know, blaming the other person, blaming ourselves, blaming God. Sarah falls into these. She tries for years, nothing happens. So she takes matters into her own hand. She comes up with this idea that her husband, she goes, why don't you have sex with our maidservant? 
And that's her idea. So this is, and it says, then Sarah said to Abram, you, this is after it works. She gets pregnant. She goes, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering because the maidservant's pregnant. I put my servant in your arms and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. So she, see, in those days, they, they really knew that the problem could be the woman, the problem could be the man, the problem could be both. And so really what she's doing here is as years and years have gone by, really decades, and she goes up to Abraham, and really what she's saying is, is let's find out whose fault it is. And she goes, here's my plan. Turns out it's her own fault. And so, but instead of owning that or something, she, she blames, she goes, you know what, this is, all, this is all your fault. And it was her idea. You know, she goes, it's your fault. And she, she obviously has this hurt feeling, she's disappointed, she's feeling insecure, all of those are valid emotions, but the way she expresses it is by blaming, is by blaming. Do you know anybody like that when they, things don't go their way? They blame, they blame everybody, they blame the government, they blame the environment, and they, they're always blaming, rarely do they ever uh, own up to anything. Number three is fatalism. So there's worrying, there's blaming, then there's this idea that uh, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. You know, it is what it is. Case sera, sera. There's nothing I can do about it. And, and uh, from a theological or philosophical perspective, that it's kind of like God is, uh, is, he's the one who's holding this, holding this blessing back from me. He knows what I want. I've gone to him over and over, and it's not happening. And so at one level, there's kind of like the sovereignty of God. God's in control. But at another level, it's like, you know, God's punishing me. He's judging me. He, he's, he's holding back some blessing because of some kind of mess that I got into before. We talked a little bit about this last, last week. This idea that God's out to judge me and hurt me. Uh, Genesis there, 6, 2, he says, So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. And so this, you know, the, the Lord's the one. He's, he's the one who's kept me from the blessing, from getting pregnant. God's keeping me from finding the mate that I need, that I want. He's holding me back from this financial blessing. He's refusing to answer the prayer for my healing or for uh, some intervention for somebody. And we can find ourselves falling, falling into that same thing. So Jesus, he warns, and we looked at this verse real briefly last week. He's, remember, he's walking with his disciples and they come upon a man who is blind. He was blind from birth. And it says, as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he, who's, that he was born blind? Now, the man was blind. Now, if a man's blind, then, then the assumption is that he sinned and he's getting what he's deserved. But if he's born blind, then the assumption is that his, one of his parents must have sinned. They must have done something wrong. And that's why he, uh, God is withholding this blessing, the very thing that they wanted. And, uh, and, and so it says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus doesn't say, well, yeah, it's because uh, the mother was an idolater or, 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 or yeah, the dad had an affair and that's why he's, no, he's saying actually this is an opportunity for God to uh, do something great. This is an opportunity for God. And so when we have dreams that are deferred, we need to make sure and not fall into this narrative that God is out to punish us and give us what we deserve. One of the great Christian theologians of the, the fifth century, Augustine, he said this about, about this issue of fatalism. He said, we do not know why God's judgment makes a good man poor and a wicked man rich, nor why the wicked man enjoys the best of health while a man of religion wastes away in illness. Even then it is not consistent. Good men also have good fortune and evil men find evil fortune. So though we do not know by what judgment these things are carried out or permitted by God in whom is the highest virtue and the highest wisdom and the highest justice and in whom there is no weakness, no rashness, nor unfairness, it is nonetheless beneficial for us to learn not to regard as important the good or evil fortunes which we see shared by good and evil persons alike. That is his way of saying, we don't always understand. We don't know why 
bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. He says, but also good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. But God is sovereign, but we don't always understand it. But there is not a certain constant that we can find there other than God is good and God is sovereign. On the back of your outline, two things I think we can pull away from this this story that we're looking at today. Number one is, is when we have an unrealized dream to keep moving forward. You see, the tendency is, is for us to get stuck, for us to circle the wagon, for us to get paralyzed, to not move forward, to, uh, to just kind of perseverate where we're at. Abraham and Sarah, they don't do everything right, but, but I like the fact that they move, that, that they, that they move forward. And even in moving forward, they make mistakes, but at least they're doing something. They're moving forward. Abraham responds to his decades of unanswered prayer by looking into, uh, he considers adoption. Genesis 15 there, he says, but Abraham said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who you inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abraham said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. This certainly was an option for, for him. He was saying, hey, I don't have kids. I have somebody who's been uh, the, with me. He's a younger man. He's grown up with me. M- maybe he'll be the person that uh, inherits everything. I'll, I'll, I'll adopt him. Now, the truth is, for that one in eight cu- uh, couples that struggle with infertility, uh, adoption is becoming less and less of an option, specific, certainly uh, adoption from other countries. China used to be the number one place where adopted kids would come in, and that's dropped almost to nothing because they changed uh, their rules uh, a few years ago. Guatemala was the number two. They completely shut it down because of the corruption that was happening, and countries all over the world uh, have shut their doors. Overseas adoptions by Americans has gone, for example, from 23,000 in 2004 to less than 6,000 last year. And that's nationwide for a whole year. So that door has com- almost completely closed for so many people. And with almost a million abortions happening every year, there's just very few children to adopt. However, That being said, I want you to hear of an amazing story of a couple in our church and their faith walk as they struggle with infertility and how they encountered some of the challenges that went went with that and the blessing. Watch this with me. My name is Jonay Steinman. Um, I have been a member of Vineyard Community Church for about two years now, been attending for about three. I'm married to Spencer Steinman. Um, We moved to Virginia Beach about three years ago. We got stationed here, my husband's in the Navy. Um, We've been married for just over nine years. When we got married, we decided early on that we wanted to wait a couple years until we wanted to start having kids. We wanted to live the the dream of just going and traveling or doing things we always wanted to do and just enjoy those together. We ended up not going by that plan. We decided that we would start early, um, earlier than the five years, about three years in. We started trying. After about a year, nothing was happening and uh, so Spencer decided that he was going to go get tested. Everything came back normal. Um, Then I went and got tested. All my tests came back normal as well. So our doctor just recommended that we continue trying um, on our own. We're just thinking that we just didn't have it right. We just kept trying and kept thinking that it was was gonna come and as people supported us around us, they said it was gonna be there, just wait, be patient, and it never came. And the tough part was people around us saying that you just, just be patient, just, you know, God has a plan for you. And that was tough to constantly hear and then every month when the time came to take a pregnancy test or to see if there's any any success it was no again and again through the course of two years we did four or five rounds of artificial insemination um, and of course it didn't take and this is where it became pretty heartbreaking just because um, we were really hopeful. This fertility specialist really kind of instilled that hope back in us that we lost over the last, you know, four years. And, um, but 
with each month that came, it was just more and more heartbreak and disappointment. I really kind of just felt God putting it on my heart for adoption. Um, but then we also had the, the route of in vitro. In vitro would have been cheaper because we would have had a lot of help from the military, but um, I, just didn't, I just didn't have a peace with it. They were talking to Spencer about adoption, and at first he was pretty uh, hesitant with it. I was never about it at all. I always was like, it's gonna be mine or nothing. I just backed off and, and let God kind of work on his heart. And as the, the chances of a natural birth were less, I began to think more about what being a parent is to me. It didn't have to be for me to be a great dad to a baby. We were on our way to Florida for Christmas, and um, I just said, all right, God, this is it. I, ha I have to do it one more time. And I remember exactly where we were, and I just said, so I want to talk to you a little bit more about adoption, and he was instantly on board. Yeah, so we decided to do the, uh, the adoption and went to a local agency here in town. We just felt so much hope. All that hope that has been stripped away from us, we just felt like it was just flooding back into our lives. And so we did all that we needed to do. They expedited the process for us because Spencer was going on a six-month deployment in two months. And so we got pretty much everything done. In August 1st of 2016, we submitted our final profile for our book and that's where the waiting game began. And um, Spencer came home from deployment six months later, and um, we, uh, 20 days after he got home, we got the call that we were matched. Um, Kaslin was born on January 15th of 2017. Um, we got the call on January 20th, and we went and brought her home on five days later on January 25th. You know, we waited seven years for her, and she has made every single second of waiting worth it. A verse that has really helped me through these past seven years is um, Psalm 56, 3, it says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So I just encourage anybody out there that um, may be in a situation where we were, um, you may be there now, you may, it may be something that you have in the future, but um, just explore your options and just trust that God is there and he has an amazing plan for you and, um, and just to trust in that. Well, it's a great story. You know, that long wait and their dream was deferred and everybody's story looks different. But a big part of it is just trusting God in the situation, moving forward, saying, God, I'm going to believe in you. This is what Abraham does. Sarah, she goes a different route. She looks for a surrogate mother. Uh, in the ancient world, surrogacy was an option. Uh, Genesis 16, there, verses 2 and 4, go sleep with my maidservant, perhaps I can build a family through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abraham had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took the Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with her, with Hagar, and she conceived when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her. Her mistress. So there was obviously some friction. Well, in vitro fertilization wasn't successful until uh, 1977, 1978. So obviously that was not an option. But a surrogacy was, and it was, it was actually a part of the ancient world. In the Code of Hammurabi, they say uh, uh, there that somebody can take their servant girl, give them, or the wife can give them to her husband, and when they, when she has that child, it would be known that uh, she would, she, even though she was the biological mother, she would not raise the child; the wife would, and that was written. Uh, for the Babylonians around the same time that Abraham and, and, and Sarah were alive. And so this is the, the same kinds of thing that they're going into with surrogacy. They're, they're, uh, she's saying, here's, here's the maidservant. Let's do this surrogacy thing. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work out like she had hoped. So she has a plan. And, and, and there's, 
there's some negative to that plan. I, I want to talk about it in a second. But before we get there, I want to. The positive is that she did something. She's moving forward. She's she's not going to just sit here and lick her wounds and let a dark cloud form over her and live in that place. She's saying, I'm going to do something about it. And there's some real value with that when you say, I am going to do something about my financial problems. I'm going to do something about my health problems. I'm going to do something about uh, this addiction. I'm not going to just let it go on year after year after year. Now, one out of uh, eight couples, I, as I mentioned, have uh, infertility problems. Half of them, these couples, never go and see a specialist, never do anything about it. Uh, the, out, of, out of the women that go to their OBGYN, half of them never go back more than once or twice to really do anything about their infertility. And so you have one-sixth or one-seventh of all of the couples that have struggle with infertility really go and see a, f- a fertility specialist, even though there's many, many things that uh, these specialists can, can help with today. Many of these things can be corrected. Uh, if it's an anatomical problem, such as uh, endometriosis, scarring, a majority of women facing that with surgery can have that corrected. If it's an ovulation problem, 80% of those women can take uh, some, some, some kind of uh, fertility drugs and solve that. Uh, if it's a sperm problem, 80% of the men can have that corrected. There's a lot of things that can be done, but often that people don't. They, 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 don't, they don't move forward. They kind of just, uh, you know, what do I do now? So certainly that can be lauded with, with this couple, Abraham and Sarah. They're trying to do something. Now, the negative thing is, is that they're not always doing the right thing. And certainly with, uh, with, with Hagar, this spins out. Uh, they're despising each other. It didn't turn out like she had wanted at all. And when, we're, when, when we move forward, activity by itself is not necessarily good. I mean, there's, there's activity that's in faith. I'm going to trust God to do something. And then there's kind of like, uh, God had his chance. I'm not going to trust in him anymore. I'm going to do this on my own. I'm going to make this happen myself. And that's the kind of activity you want to avoid. That's the kind that ends up causing you a lot of pain. When you go, I can't trust God anymore. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm on my own on this one. You see, part of moving forward is this getting godly counsel, going to God's word, looking at God's word, saying, I want to make sure and move forward in a way that is I'm moving with God and not, and not against him. Second thing is take your liability and turn it into an asset. Now, Paul had some significant liabilities, the Apostle Paul had, 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 uh, he had been stoned uh, by rocks, and he, you know, he had, he had shipwrecked, he had been beaten, he had been whipped, he had been put in prison multiple times, and when he writes to Philemon, uh, he's in prison. But now, now Paul's walk, it just so happened, he didn't end up having a family. He had no kids, and, 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 and so here he is, in a, uh, in a prison cell with a young man, and he ends up adopting him. It's probably not an official adoption, but it's an adoption by relationship and by mentoring. He pours his life into this young man. He had done that with Timothy and Titus as well. But here he says to Philemon, he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. That's not his son, not, bi- not biologically. But he had adopted him, and he said, I'm going to mentor this guy like he is my son who became my son while I was in chains. You see, when we take an assessment, we look at our liabilities, sometimes you can just say, well, I'm going to make an asset out of it while I'm waiting. What do you do while you're waiting? Okay, your dream hasn't come about. Your dream is deferred. What do you do while you're waiting? You say, while I'm waiting, I wanted to be healed. I'm not yet. So here I am. I'm at the the doctors. I'm at the hospital. If I'm going to be in the hospital uh, for two weeks, I might as well spend some time with God. I might as well. I can take those uh, opportunities and share my faith with the nurse. The nurses that come or the the people from the the food service and share when they deliver some food or with the medical techs, the tech staff. And while I'm here, I might as well do something. If I have to sit here for hours on dialysis, 
then I can build a relationship with the person to my left or to my right and, and, and see if, you know, maybe I can encourage them. Maybe God will use me in some way. You see, while you're waiting, while you're waiting, let's say you don't have kids. Maybe you're somebody who's saying, I don't have any kids. Well, while you're waiting, is there another kid you can love? Is there another kid you can mentor? Maybe there's somebody in our kids' ministry or in our youth ministry. There's kids that need some love and some mentoring. There's plenty of young, young people that were raised without a parent, raised without a father, and there's an opportunity to bless. So it's just instead of, or you can just, it really comes down to your focus, right? What are you going to focus on? Your, you know, your liability or how God can use you through that. Proverbs, I want to end with this last verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. So we want to keep going. We don't want to, we don't want to get stuck. We want to take our liabilities, turn them into assets. But in order to do that, we need to, we need to lean in, not into our own understanding, but to God. Acknowledge him. Say, God, I want you to be walking with me. We're going to do this together. Let's bow our heads and pray. We're just going to take a moment here and on this Mother's Day and just take a moment and pray. Many of you have a lot to be thankful for. You have children. You have a child or uh, maybe more than one child. And maybe it's not, maybe the kids are older and there's things that you could focus on that would be disappointing. But God gave you a child, and you can, you can be thankful for that. Focus on what God is doing in your life. While you're waiting, if you don't have a kid, if you, don't, if you have a dream that is deferred, while you're waiting, take your liability, make it an asset. Use your life to count for what God wants you to do. Don't fall into worrying, blaming, or fatalism, like you're a victim. Don't let that happen. That'll sideline you. You'll get, you'll, get, you'll, you'll get off track. Now, would you pray with me? Say, Lord, and think of your deferred dream. Say, I lift up this deferred dream to you. Help me, Lord, to move forward but to move with you. I don't want to just go in my own effort, my own strength. I want to have activity that's filled with peace, filled with joy, filled with strength. That you give believers who follow in your steps. You say, God, today I'm going to trust you. If you've never put your faith in Christ, just say, God, today I put my faith in Jesus Christ, the work of the cross. I don't have to think about you judging me for something I did because Christ already paid for it all. That's been judged. It's happened on Calvary 2,000 years ago. I get to walk in grace and in freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.